Okay, that is friendly. All right, so um, I already talked a little bit, all of you weren't here, so I guess kind of restart a little bit. Uh, we're going to begin quickly uh, doing a blast through of logic, maybe explain and then explain the next step that we're gonna do. Why are we doing a quick run through of logic? Logic is the, we're, we're going to be looking at arguments, right? If I'm trying to convince you that something is true that you don't already accept is true, I need an argument in order to do that. I need to give you reasons to accept my conclusion. And so that's what we're gonna be looking at in philosophy. We're gonna be looking at arguments, arguments, arguments. Someone's gonna state, here's my premises, here's my argument, here's my conclusion. We're going to need to be able to do an analysis of that argument. We're gonna to need to be able to analyze our premises, see if we agree with the premises. Second, analyze our arguments, see if their argument's valid. And then three, look at the conclusion and see if we can accept the conclusion. We're gonna be doing that over and over again. And so we need to have some basic understanding of logic. Logic is what we use to do an analysis of arguments. Uh, the simplest way you could say what logic is, logic is the rules from going from true statements to true statements, or how you can produce true statements from true statements. So if you agree with the premises, then you should be able to use logic to construct what we call a valid argument. So we'll do a quick blast here of logic today. Then the second weird thing that we're gonna do before we actually jump into the textbook is a uh, quick trying to give historical context. So we're going to do a blast through of world history, trying to get to around 600 BC with Thales in Greece, just to make sure you have a notion of what's going on in the world and where we're talking about and when we're talking about. Uh, the reason I'm doing that is simply because of my own personal psychology. I can't keep track of what's going on unless I can plug it into some historical context. So part of that's just for me. I'm just gonna assume that a bunch of you are like me and you need that same historical context. So I'm gonna try to as quickly as I can set up a world history context for where we are. And then as we go through the course, I'll drift away from the book every now and then to just cover major political events going on. So for those of you who know some history, we'll definitely talk about things like the Grecian Persian Wars, the Peloponnesian Wars. We'll talk about the rise of Rome in Italy stuff like that to keep track of major political events going on, who we're talking about, and we'll also reference tons of maps so that we know where we're talking about. Ultimately, we'll be talking about around the Mediterranean Sea. If, when I say Mediterranean Sea, you already don't know what that means, you need to go Google a map of the Mediterranean Sea and stare at it for a while. We're gonna be just using that left and right. We don't have time to uh, memorize all the geography around there, so. If I say something like Greece, you need a vague notion of where that is around the Mediterranean. If I say Italy, you need a vague notion. That's one that looks like a boot, uh, stuff like that. Egypt, you have to know where that is. Okay, and then we'll actually jump in where the author jumps in. Um, last thing I should say about the book, the author starts the book with a good discussion of uh, the difference between uh, poetry and he doesn't say poetry, what does he say? It's poetry. He called it poetry. The difference between poetry and philosophy, and he's trying to draw this, you know what, we can cover that when we mention the Greeks, because we'll have to mention that history anyways. So, never mind. We'll cover that when we get to it. So, let's start the material today. So, today mostly what we're doing is logic, but briefly before we talk about logic, we need to talk about reasoning. What is reasoning? Reasoning, your reason for something, is your justification why you think something's valid. Roughly speaking, we have three types of reasoning that we use. The first and most valid type of reasoning that we use is called deductive reasoning. For those of you who have taken a logic course before, it's just a logical implication. That's what deductive reasoning is. For those of you that haven't, you use this type of reasoning left and right. It's the most solid type of reasoning there is. And here's an example, the common example. So if I tell you, first off, Socrates is a man, and second off, all men are mortal, what can you conclude? Socrates is mortal. Perfect. And what you just barely used right there is deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning says that if this is true, then this is true. Now there's an important note with deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning did not say that Socrates is a man is true. Deductive reasoning did not say that all men are mortal is true. Deductive reasoning did not say that Socrates is immortal is true. It simply said that if Socrates is a man, and if all men are mortal, then Socrates is mortal. 
the implication is true. This implies this is what is true. And that is true to the extent that you can get true. This is what we call a logical implication. And we'll cover this more with exact terminology later, but so deductive reasoning, you just barely use it. Another example of deductive reasoning that you use left and right in mathematics is something along the lines of if x is equal to 2, then 2x is equal to 4. four. You just did it again. Deductive reasoning. So, deductive reasoning, logical implication. Second type of reasoning we use all the time is called inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning. Now, inductive reasoning is the reason that you think that if I drop this right now, what's going to happen? It's going to fall to the floor. How on earth did you come up with that? Huh? Experience. Past experience. Every single time you watch someone let go of an object and there's nothing visible that you can see holding it up, it fell to the floor. Now that is not very reliable reasoning compared to deductive reasoning. Is it possible that I let this go and it doesn't fall to the floor? Is that possible? Yeah. yeah. Some people skeptical. How could that be possible? It's possible that there's like some meteor flying through the space right now and it's about to come really, really close to the Earth. And the second I let this go, it's close enough that it exerts the same gravitational force upwards that the Earth pulls downwards. And so the inside I let it go, it hovers in the air for a second. That's possible. This is also metallic. Maybe I've worked up some system where I've got a magnet above it up in the ceiling that you don't know about. And it's pulling on this the same much the gravity is pulling down and I let go and it hovers. Right? That's possible. So, once we get to inductive reasoning, it is no longer a surefire thing. It's no longer guaranteed. We're now arguing with probabilities. And we have to use inductive reasoning to get every single one of our premises. This is true in science. This is also true in philosophy. We have to inductively reason to our premises. Notice that deductive reasoning cannot tell me that Socrates is a man. Deductive reasoning cannot tell me that all men are immortal. A statement like this is something that we'd have to use inductive reasoning to validate. And there's only a, we can only validate this with a strong probability. We can never know for certain that all men are mortal. But we do know for certain that if these two premises are true, then this conclusion is true. That we know for certain, no question there. So deductive reasoning helps us go from premises to guarantee conclusions. If the premises are true, the conclusion is true. That's what deductive reasoning does. Inductive reasoning is one of the ways that we validate our premises. So we use inductive reasoning to come up with premises, and then we apply deductive reasoning to those premises to draw conclusions using logic. That's vaguely what we do. Uh, third type of reasoning that we often use, the one that we actually use the most, is called abductive reasoning. Now, well, let me say one more thing about inductive reasoning. Often with inductive reasoning, what do we do? We look at a bunch of particular phenomena and we create a generalization, right? We watch objects fall, watch objects fall, watch objects fall, generalize. If you drop an object, it's going to fall. So we go from a bunch of particular situations and we generalize to some generalized rule, some generalized law, right? right. Abductive reasoning, we're using the inverse of that. Abductive reasoning, we take all our generalizations to try and reconstruct a specific phenomenon, right? Common example, one that you probably all experienced before, you were walking outside and you finally suddenly felt a little drop on your hand, right? And you thought, oh, is it raining? Now maybe it was raining. It's not the case that every time you felt a drop on your hand, it was due to rain, right? For all you know, I mean, you could have accidentally like walked past a sprinkler going off over a brick wall, wind was blowing a fluid drop, got on your hand or whatever, something happened. Maybe you're talking to someone who likes to spray a little bit when they talk and they had a difficult tea and it got you, <laughs> right? Who knows? That's abductive reasoning. Uh, the common example I like to use for abductive reasoning is a uh, kid with a cookie. So here you are, you're in a room and you got this little toddler and you put on a stool in front of them a little chocolate chip cookie. You walk out of the room, you wait a couple minutes, you come back in the room. Cookie's gone, there's crumbs all over the place. The toddler's standing there, they got chocolate spread on their mouth. Conclusion? Kid the kid ate the cookie. Now, do we know that? No. no. For all you know, Big Brother was hiding in the closet. As soon as you left the room, he came out, he ate the cookie, saved the chocolate chip and some crumbs, crushed him up, smeared it on the kid's face, went back and hid in the closet. You come in, you get after the toddler, poor kid. Yeah. They didn't do anything wrong. Abductive reasoning. Oftentimes when we use abductive reasoning, 
we uh, come to the conclusion beyond a reasonable doubt is common terminology. This is the type of reasoning that we have to use in like a court of law. This is the type of reasoning that we have to use in history. This type of reasoning is the reason that we often use in science or philosophy. And then this is logic and math. Now, notice that when we're reasoning abductively, we can also use inductive reasoning, and we can also use deductive reasoning. And when we're reasoning inductively, we can also use deductive reasoning. Right? In science, it's okay to use math. In math, it is not okay to use science. In history, it's okay to use science. In science, it is not okay to use history. Get a vague notion there? Okay. So those are the basic types of reasoning. Hopefully, you have some intuition for them. And now we're going to use logic, and from here on out, we're only allowed to use deductive reasoning for this, for, for developing logic. We'll be allowed to use these other reasonings as the class progresses. So now we're going to start with logic. And we're going to do the really fast version of logic. If you want to do a full class on logic after this, that's fine. We can do that. I've already done one once, so be happy to do it again, do a much better job the second time. <laughs> but here's a quick version. Okay. Logic. So in logic, we start out with a statement. So a definition. A statement is a sentence that is either true or false, but not both. And maybe tell you the textbook I'm using for this. So this uh, run through of logic that I'm doing really quick. Uh, this is a high school geometry textbook that uh, the Academy and Masada think that students can't keep up with for some reason, but it's a great textbook. And Masada has a bunch of copies in their library, if for any reason you want it. And I'm just going to do, I'm just using their logic section, running through exactly what it is they say. You're awesome. Bookmark. Thanks. Okay. So, definition. A statement is a sentence that is either true or false, but not both. So I'll let you run through. Consider the following. Go back home. Statement, yes or no? Go back home. Is that true? It must be false. No, it's not a statement. Two times two equals five. Is that a statement? Yes. Yes. It's a false statement, but it's a statement. Let's see. Two times two equals four. Yes. yes. True statement. New York is a suburb of Los Angeles. Yes. That's true? No, it's a statement. Oh, okay. Thursday up tar paper. You heard me correct. <laughs> Thursday up tar paper. Uh, what? No, no. <laughs> the silliness of speedily. No. Now, all right. So there are some examples of statements and not statements. You got them all right. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Now we can combine statements to create more complex statements. So could have taken a statement like Donnie's wearing a shirt. That's a statement. Donnie's wearing pants. That's a statement. Donnie's wearing a shirt and Donnie's wearing pants is a way of combining those two statements. So when we combine two statements with that magical word and, we call it the conjunction of the two statements. So definition. Uh, Greek letters, so maybe you make some mention of this. That Greek letter right there is called alpha. That Greek letter right there is called beta. Anytime I use a Greek letter, it is representing a statement. So alpha could represent a statement like Donnie's wearing a shirt. Anyone confused by the Greek letters? Okay. So if alpha and beta are statements, then the statement alpha and beta is called their conjunction. Does that definition make sense? Yeah. Okay. How can we take issue with that definition? What's the problem with that definition? Those of you who have taken classes with me before, be critical of that for a second, and why should we not accept this as a definition so far? It's them. No. Then the statement alpha and beta, how on earth do I know that alpha and beta is a statement? I know alpha is a statement, I know beta is a statement. How do I know that anding two statements together is still a statement? Now you relied on your intuition, and you all know how that can get you in trouble. And so you just accepted it. But no, we haven't yet defined how we apply a truth or false value to this. So the only way that alpha and beta can still be a statement is if it's either true or it's false, but not both. So just because I know that alpha is true or false, and just because I know that beta is true or false, how on earth do I know that the whole thing together, alpha and beta, is true or false? 
So we need to come up with a way to do that. We're going to create something here called a truth table. And our truth table is going to tell us how to assign truth or falsity to this whole statement. When we know that this is true and this is true, when we know that this is true and this is false, when we know that this is false and this is true, and when we know that this is false and this is false. Those are all the possible combinations. And if I can tell you how to assign truth or falsity to the whole statement in every possible case, then now it's well defined. And you can then determine when the statement's true and when the statement's false. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what we're going to do here. And we're going to construct something called a truth table. Now here's how truth tables go. So we've got the statement alpha and the statement beta. And we have four possible combinations for values of those statements. Remember, a statement is something that's what? True or false. So I can have both statements are true. The first is true and the second is false. The first is false and the second is true. And then I can have that they're both false. Does everyone understand how I fill out these two columns or should I say it again? Say it again. You're good? You got it? Wonderful. So let's come up with a natural way now of assigning alpha and beta. Get my markers. Red marker and blue marker. Yeah, you all know my markers. So, alpha is going to be, I'm just going to set up a particular instance of each of these cases, and we're going to come up with a natural way of assigning a truth value to this. When I say a truth value, I mean call it true or call it false. I'll usually say truth value. So let's say alpha is Donnie's holding a blue marker, beta is Donnie's holding a red marker. So in the case where Donnie's, we make alpha true and we make beta true. That's the situation right now. Is a statement, Donnie's holding a blue marker and Donnie's holding a red marker true? Yes. yes, so in this case it'd be true. Now let's see, if I put down the red marker, is the statement Donnie's holding a blue marker and Donnie's holding a red marker true? No. no, it's false. And if I were to put down the blue and pick up the red, it's false. false. But if I put it down, they're both the same, and so it's still false. I'm not holding either. Don't let me trick you. If I'm not holding a red marker and I'm not holding a blue marker, let's set that up. Is a statement, Donnie's holding a red marker and Donnie's holding a blue marker true? No, it's about as far from true as we can get, right? This one's definitely false. Okay, so that is the conjunction of two statements, and that's how we assign the truth value. This is called, and is called, a truth functional connective. The reason we call it that, reminding you guys who've done logic, is because if I know the truth or falsity of this and the truth or falsity of this, I can determine the truth or falsity of the entire statement. Let's look at a quick example of one that isn't truth functional, maybe, to help you get an idea of the difference. Let's look at the word because. You'll notice that because doesn't show up in logic, and we don't have a logical value for the conjunction because. Conjunction in the English sense of the word, not the logical sense of the word. So let's look at a statement. Leah, what do you have for dinner tonight? Peanut butter sandwich. Peanut butter sandwich. So let's look at a statement. Leah had a peanut butter sandwich for dinner. Is that true? Yes. Now let's say Leah came to class. Is that true? Yes. Okay, now let's put them together. Leah ate a peanut butter sandwich because Leah came to class. Is that true or is it false? Yes. What? Yeah, you see how you're struggling there? So these words that we're gonna be talking about are special words. They're logical operators, they're truth functional logical operators. What that means is that when we know the truth or false values of what we're applying these special words to, so when I know the truth or falsity of alpha and I know the truth or falsity of beta, I'm able to determine the truth or falsity of the whole thing. So if I know alpha and I know beta, I can always tell you whether alpha and beta is true. But if I know alpha and I know beta, I can't tell you whether alpha because beta is true or false. There's no way for me to determine it. I need some other extra information. Make sense? Yes. Now there's other words in the English language that we tell you to treat similar to words that we're gonna talk about up here. An example with the word and is the word but. You're often told when you were reading story problems back in, back in Masada, that when you see but in your story problem, you're supposed to interpret that as and. You remember this? No. No? This doesn't, okay, if that isn't something simple, common, then we can just keep going. Is, is there people who want to go over what I talk about with the but, or does that not apply? Uh, I want to go over it. You want to go over it. Okay, the word but. So we have and up here. 
And you'll notice that we don't have the word but. Now let's look at a statement. Uh, let's see if I can remember the one we used last year. Uh, Jill loves you. Jill still loves your brother. All right. So if I say Jill loves you and Jill still loves your brother, it's very clear what I'm saying. I'm saying the statement Jill loves you is true and the statement Jill loves your brother is true, right? Now, let's change that word. Jill loves you, but Jill still loves your brother. Did that change the meaning? Yes. Yeah. That changed the meaning. So you agree that but is somehow different from and. But you would also say, when I say Jill loves you, but Jill still loves your brother, I'm still saying that Jill loves you, right? So I'm saying this is true, and I'm saying this is true. But there's some extra subtlety there that's being implied by that but, that somehow the two statements have an effect on each other. And we're not just talking about their truth or falsity. And so we agree that and and but aren't quite the same thing, yet we can't quite capture what exactly that word but means. So if we want to treat it logically, we have to treat it identically to and, but at the same time, we, we agree that that's somehow saying a dip, something different. So it's vague, it's ambiguous. So in logic, we, we're very nitpicky. We're picking those pieces of language that are completely unambiguous. Okay, so that was and. What's our next one? Uh, disjunction, or. Oh. Upside down B, that is an and symbol. I will be using that all the time. So, fair warning, and. Okay, next, disjunction. So if alpha and beta are statements, then the statement alpha or beta is called their disjunction. Now we have the same problem that we had before. Is this well defined? Not yet. We need to have a definition for what exactly that or thing means, right? Yeah. Now, we're in trouble because logic predates the English language. And in the English language, we use or in two different senses. And so we need to pick it or. The two ways that we use or, we call the inclusive or and the exclusive or. And I'll give you an example of each. Um, the exclusive or would be if someone says... Where's Donnie? And you say, Donnie is in room five or he's in room six. What do you mean? You mean that the statement Donnie's in room five is true and the statement that he's in room six is false or the statement that he's in room six is true and the statement that he's in room five is false. In other words, you mean I'm in one and only one of those rooms. Being in both rooms isn't a possibility. Does that make sense? Yep. Donnie's in room five or he's in room six. Means one and not the other. One and only one of those two statements is true. Good? Yeah. Now I'll give you another example. Um, admissions at a university. So you're applying to some university and they have to apply, they say that you have to uh, get, um, well, keep it simple. Let's say that they say you had to take physics or calculus to apply to their university. You have to take physics or calculus. Now let's say that you're the unlucky kid who took both. Are they gonna kick you out now? You can't come in? No, that's what we call the inclusive sense of the word or. So we have inclusive or, which means at least one of the two is true. And then we have exclusive or, where one and only one of the two is true. In logic, the or that we are talking about is the inclusive or. At least one is true. Does that make sense? Okay, so now let's uh, fill out our table. Same thing we had before. We've got the four possible combinations of alpha and beta. So we can have false, true, true, false, 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 true, true. Try to switch up the order for those of you who just memorize orders. And let's set up each situation. I can't remember which was which. I think it was this. Yeah. So I say Donnie's holding a red marker or Donnie's holding a blue marker. True or false? True? True. Perfect. Now I say Donnie's holding a red marker or Donnie's holding a blue marker. Still true, wonderful. Donnie's holding a red marker or Donnie's holding a blue marker. False. False, wonderful. 
And then finally, Donnie's holding a red marker or Donnie's holding a blue marker. True. At least one of the two cases has to be true for the whole thing to be true. Perfect. Okay. So next now we're going to be talking about the negation of a statement. So if and notice that these two before we're combining two statements together, this is going to be an operator on just one statement. So if alpha is a statement, then the statement alpha is false is called the negation of alpha. We also say not alpha. Does that, everything I read there make sense? And we just need to fill out the table? Mm -hmm. So if alpha is true, then not alpha is false. false. And if alpha is false, not alpha is true. true. Set up an example really quick. If Donnie's holding a red marker is true, then the statement, Donnie's holding a red marker is false, is false. <laughs> Let's say that different. Yeah. So if Donnie's holding a red marker is true, then not Donnie is holding a red marker is false. false. Let me write one more thing up here on how we can often interpret this from our other book. Another way that we can always write not alpha is it is not the case that alpha. So maybe try that one and maybe this one will quick one. So I'm holding a red marker. Alpha is Donnie's holding a red marker. It is not the case that Donnie's holding a red marker. Uh, false. false. Okay. And then vice versa. Now I'm not holding a red marker. It is not the case that Donnie's holding a red marker. True. True. Yeah. Everyone following that? Yes. Good? Yep. Okay. Now, this is crucial, this is subtle and crucial that you recognize that if I know that alpha is true, then I know that not alpha is false. And if I know that not alpha is true, then I know that alpha is false. And I know that sounds like the most obvious thing you've ever heard, but this is the one that's going to come back to bite you almost the most. The implication will get you more, but this one will get you. So, not alpha is the contradiction of alpha. When you have two contradicting statements, one of the statements has to be true, and one of the statements has to be false. There's no way around it. So let's jump into some examples and then try and hammer the point home some more. So all swans are white. Let's look at its contradiction. Its contradiction is some swans are black, right? No, those two statements are what we call contrary statements. These two statements cannot both be true, but they can definitely both be false. We could live in a world of only yellow swans. If we lived in a world of only yellow swans, this statement is false and this statement is false. These are not contradicting statements. These are just contrary statements. So contrary means they can't both be true. Contradicting means one has to be true, and one has to be false. Okay, so we're always going to be comparing with this top statement. Let's look at this one paired with this one. All swans are white, at least one swan is black. Are those contradicting or contrary? Contradicting. Contrary. Contrary. What if we live in a world with only yellow swans? Oh. Right? Yes. Yes. Is anyone getting confused by the fact that uh, we don't live in a world that has only yellow swans? Because maybe there's a point that we need to drive home a little bit. Logic is in no way contingent upon the facts of this universe. The truth or falsity of logic does not depend on the circumstances of our universe. Come up here, back when we were looking at Socrates as a man and all men are mortal, imply Socrates is mortal. Notice that you know that this statement is true, even if you have no clue who Socrates is, what man means, and what mortal means. For example, I can get rid of Socrates and put foo. Foo is a bar. All bars are, I don't know, doughs. Therefore, what can you conclude? Foo is, oh, all doesn't really work well with our language, right? All bars are dough, therefore foo is dough. And you have, you do not in any way need to know anything about Socrates, anything about man, and anything about mortals to know that this is true. 
If I know that all foos are bar and all bars are dough, then I know foo is dough. Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> Let's write it symbolically. If I say A is a B, all B's are C's, then A is a C. Does that make sense? And it doesn't matter what you plug in for that we kind of have. Here's my variables. Realize that A is a word that we're also using. So underline so that we know the difference between what I'm talking about. A as a variable and lowercase a it should be used to x, y, z. But you can plug in any A's and B's and C's, any words that you want there, and it doesn't matter. The statement is still true. That's what we mean by this statement being true, this implication being true, was no way contingent upon the facts of this universe. You don't need to know anything about Socrates, anything about men, anything about mortal, and it's still true. When we're talking about the contradicting statements, it in no way depends on facts of this universe. It doesn't matter if we live in a universe where it just so happens to be all spawns or white. That's completely irrelevant. It's two statements that one has to be true and one has to be false in any given universe. Okay, so let's continue now. So this was a contrary statement, this was a contrary statement. Let's try this one. All swans are white, some swans are not white. Contradicting. contradicting. Now we've got contradicting. Notice one of these has to be true and one of these has to be false. Notice if you try to say this is false, you're accidentally going to say this. Or if you try to say this is false, you're going to accidentally say this. What if, only if I try to say all swans are white is false, that means that there's a swan that's not white. Right? Which just seems like some swans are not white? Not necessarily, because what if there's only one? One is some. <laughs> if there's only one thing in a room, is there something in the room? <laughs> there's something, but not some things. Okay. Did I put an S? Swans. Some swans. Some swans. Some swans are not white. Okay, there is some swan or not white. There we go. Some swan or not white. Yeah, a little bit of uh, the English coming through. You got to phrase it exactly right. But this would, by most people, be considered a contradicting statement of this. Yeah. Some and there exists are used as logically equivalent expressions. Okay, continuing. Let's look at this one. All swans are white. Not all swans are white. Contradicting. contradicting for sure, right? So this was contradicting. This was contradicting. Let's look at another one. All swans are white. No swans are white. Contrary. Contrary. We could live in a universe of only yellow swans. Oh, wait. We could live in a universe where half our swans are white. If we live in a universe where half our swans are white, then this is false and this is false. That makes sense how these are contrary? Can't both be true. But just because I know this true is true doesn't mean that I know that this is false. And just because I know that this is true does not mean I know that this is false. Or vice versa. If I know that this is false, I don't necessarily know that this is true. If I know that this is false, I don't necessarily know that this is true. One has to be true. One has to be false. It's contradicting. Uh, let's look at this one. All swans are white. Let's see this statement. Every swan in existence is white. Are those contrary or contradicting? Neither. It's the same exact statement. Yeah. Okay. So one more important no note that we can mention here. The author of this book doesn't really make it completely clear because this is for high school students, but we'll assume that you can do a bit more than high school students, which I guess most of you are. Uh, we can encode. So eh, it's worth having a conversation proposition. Now, we'll just say these two say the same thing and leave it at that. It would bring us too much down a path I don't want to follow. Okay, so now let's see you guys come up with uh, contradicting statements. Oh, wonderful, thank you. I don't know how much of that we got. Back some. Well, it was a nice verbal one, so maybe it doesn't matter too much. Okay, 
So I've got some examples here, and now I want you guys to try and come up with the contradictory statements. Those of you who have done discrete math, do not give answers. Okay, so I'm looking for the contradiction of this statement, and notice now we're taking the contradiction of a conjunction. So we've got Donnie's holding a red marker, and Donnie's holding a blue marker. We're looking for the contradiction of this statement. What would be the contradiction of this statement? You say, Donnie's holding a red marker, or Donnie's holding a blue marker. So let's look at that for a second. And let's see if those are contradicting statements. So let's say I'm holding both. Is the first statement true? Yeah. Yes. So the second statement's false? No. No, then those are not contradicting statements. We need contradicting statements. So statements like, whenever this one is true, this one is false, and whenever this one is true, this one is false. So it's, Dottie is not holding a red marker, and Dottie is not holding a blue marker. So he says, Dottie's not holding a red marker, and Dottie's not holding a blue marker. So let's try this one out. So here I am holding both markers. Is it true that Donnie's holding a red marker and Donnie's holding a blue marker? Yes. yes. Okay. Is it true that Donnie's not holding a red marker and Donnie's not holding a blue marker? No. 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 So that was true and that was false. Okay. It worked in the first case. Let's try another case. Is it true that Donnie's holding a red marker and Donnie's holding a blue marker? No. 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 Is it true that Donnie's not holding a red marker and Donnie's not holding a blue marker? No. no. All right, we're in trouble. What else we got? You're getting there. Well, would it have to change? Would you have to change the statement depending on what you're holding? <laughs> you know, you, no, contradicting answer. statements, you can't say they're contradicting statements, but I get to change the contradiction anytime you change the universe on me. No, they have to be completely independent of the universe. It doesn't matter what the configuration of Donnie holding red and blue markers is. One of them has to always be true. One of them has to always be false. Huh? The change and or. Change and or. Perfect. No, nope. Yeah, Wrong know. one. Thank you. This one. Now let's try that one. So I'm holding both. Donnie's holding a red marker. Donnie's holding a blue marker. Is that true? Yes. yes. Donnie's not holding a red marker. Or Donnie's not holding a blue marker. Is that true? False. That one was false. So top was true, next one was false. All right, let's have another configuration. Donnie's holding a red marker and Donnie's holding a blue marker. False. Donnie's not holding a red marker or Donnie's not holding a blue marker. True. True. Notice if I switch the blue with the red, it's the exact same thing. Yeah. So we'll just go straight to the empty case now. Donnie's holding a red marker and Donnie's holding a blue marker. Donnie's not holding a red marker, or Donnie's not holding a blue marker? True. True. Wonderful. Is that clicking to your intuition? Yeah. Perfect. Now let's try another one. Now notice this time we're going to take the negation of a disjunction. Oh, he got mad. Okay. So let's do the negation of an or. Anyone think they got it? You just say Donnie's not holding a red marker and Donnie's not holding a blue marker. Perfect. Donnie's not holding a red marker and Donnie's not holding a blue marker. Perfect. And let's test it real quick. Set up our scenario. Donnie's holding a red marker. Donnie's holding a blue marker. Yeah. True? True? Donnie's not holding a red marker, and Donnie's not holding a blue marker. False. false. So the top one was true. That one was false. Case where I'm doing holding just one of them. Donnie's holding a red marker. Donnie's holding a blue marker. True. True. Donnie's not holding a red marker, and Donnie's not holding a blue marker. False. 
False. If I was just holding blue, it'd still be the same thing. Now I'm not holding either. Donnie's holding a red marker. Donnie's holding a blue marker. False. Donnie's not holding a red marker. And Donnie's not holding a blue marker. True. Wonderful. We always had one true, one false. So they were contradictions of each other. Now notice what happens. When we do the contradiction of a conjunction, we negated the two statements and we switched the and to an or. And when we did the contradiction of a disjunction, we did the negation of the two statements and we switched the or to an and. Make sense? Yeah. All right, so now let's fill out the table so that we can see it all to make sure that while our intuition is going, we're also being comfortable with the truth tables. So we got alpha beta here, we can have true, 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 false, false, true, false, false. So not alpha is false, 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 false. true, true. Wonderful, not beta? False, true, false, true. Alpha and beta? Is there anyone confused by how we're getting these values? Yeah. Yeah. Little bit. Wonderful. Okay. So we started. Yeah. Jeremy's just giving you the answers. That's all I need. <laughs> okay. So alpha and beta. Here we've got all our possible combinations of truth values for alpha and beta. Right. Right. Now we're going to say if alpha is true and beta is true, what are all these values, and we're going to plug them in. And then we're going to say if alpha is true, beta is false. And so we're doing each of the four scenarios, plugging in what all these values are. That's all we're doing. Now, rather than doing it row by row, we're going to do it column by column simply for the sake of uh, thinking about one logical operator at a time. But what we're ultimately going to do is we're going to show that not alpha and beta is the same thing as not alpha or not beta, which is what we just did up there. We're just now formally proving it instead of relying on a concrete example. And then we're also going to show that not alpha or beta is the same thing as not alpha and not beta. Same thing we did up there. So formally proving the intuition that we just established with those examples. Is that good? OK. Did someone say no? No, I'm a little bit confused on that last thing. Is it not alpha or beta and not? Alpha and beta. Not and alpha and beta. Or sorry, I might be saying the words wrong, but my symbols are right. <laughs> that will happen a lot. So not alpha or beta is the same thing as not alpha and not beta. Which is what we have written right here. If we do the not of alpha or beta, we get not alpha and not beta. Okay. That makes sense? Okay. Anyone else or we get to continue? Okay. okay. So here we just really did alpha and beta. So now we're going to do not alpha and beta. So if alpha and beta is true, not alpha and beta is false. 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 If alpha and beta is false, not alpha and beta is true. true. Wonderful. Now we got to look clear back to not alpha and not beta over here, and we got to or them together. So we're oring together these two columns. So false or false is false. False. False or true is true. True or false is, and then true or true is true. Yeah. Inclusive or. Yeah, that will get you. So now notice that this column and this column have the exact same values in every possible universe. If alpha and beta are both true, they give the same value. If you have true false, they give the same value. If you have false true, they give the same value. If they have false false, they give the same value. That's how you prove with truth tables that two different logical expressions are actually identical. They're somehow the same. The same way that five plus five and 10 are somehow the same, this and this are somehow the same. They're always the same value no matter what. That's what we were demonstrating with this table. Does that make sense, what we were doing? Okay, so now let's do it again for our bottom example. So here we're doing alpha or beta. So we're looking, we're oring these two columns together. Uh, here we have true, 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 
Oh, it's wonderful. And now we're just going to negate this column. So this is alpha or beta. We're going to write not alpha or beta, which is the same thing as false, 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 true. And now finally, we're doing the conjunction of these two. We're adding together these two columns. So false and false is false, false and true is false, false. true and false is false. false. And true and true is? True. And notice, once again, that this column and this column have the exact same values. So they're logically equivalent. They're somehow encoding the exact same information. So our intuition that we used to derive those examples, that worked, and we just formally proved it always works. So the way that you we typically think about this is that when I distribute a not across a conjunction, so not alpha and beta is equal to, it turns the and into an or and I distribute the not. So that's not alpha or not beta, not B, beta. And then similarly, if I want to distribute a not across an, and, an or, then that would switch us to an and. So we just barely proved like a distribution law for something called Boolean algebra, do an algebra with logic. How far over do we got? Let's just go all the way. So I forgot whiteboard. Not quite the whole thing. Okay, whole thing's on there. Now I don't have to worry about the camera. Okay. Now, uh, the gotcha of all of logic: implications, conditionals, if-then statements. So let's go over the definition and then try to establish some intuition. So if alpha and beta are statements, then the statement alpha implies beta is called an implication. Now we need to define when this is true, but we have 101 ways in the English language of saying this exact same thing. And it turns out every proof is an implication. So understanding implications is vital to understanding anything we're going to do from here on out. Every argument is an implication. It says if this is true, then this is true. Or alpha being true implies beta is also true. That's how every single argument works. It's always used as logical operator, so we need to understand it. And we need to understand all the ways in the English language that we can say this. So, we can say alpha implies beta. We can also say if alpha, then beta. We can also say beta if alpha. We can also say alpha only if beta. We can also say alpha is a sufficient condition for beta. We can also say beta is a necessary condition for alpha. Now that's a lot, so what we're going to do, I found these two statements that for some reason just help a quick in kids' heads. And so we're gonna use these two statements and we're gonna plug them into each of these to help the intuition click. So alpha is going to be, there's fire, beta is going to be, there's oxygen. A little bit of chemistry, you can't have fire without oxygen. Good? You need oxygen for a fire to burn. Okay. So now let's go through each one of these and see how they're all saying the exact same thing. There is fire implies there's oxygen. Yes. Right? Next one. If there's fire, then there's oxygen. Yes. There's oxygen. There's oxygen if there's fire. False. There's yes. oxygen if there's fire. Yes. yes. You mean that there's ox? Oh, yeah, yeah. I did. Correct. Right. Oh, because there's fire. <laughs> right. There's oxygen if there's fire. That has to be the case. There has to be oxygen if there's fire. Yes. You can't have fire without the oxygen. Yeah. All right. There's, I told you, these two, you can see how this can easily be very confusing and found these statements that help just make it so much clearer. So there's fire if, sorry, there's oxygen if there's fire. There's fire only if there's oxygen. Uh, fire is a, 